This is the after chapter discussion for 9.67 part 1 and 2. I will be hosting along with Edaron today. Hello. So, yeah, that's Edaron. So let's just get ourselves started off with general impressions for this chapter. Um, I'm sure everyone has some really great, uh, so a lot of things to talk about for the general impressions. So how about we just give, you know, a favorite scene as well. General impressions and your favorite part of the chapter. And Edaron, do you want to start us off or should I? Uh, I can. Yeah. Okay. I, overall, I was not ready for this chapter. It's, um, I love chapter I talked about that pirate was able to destroy my soul and this time she actually did it again. It was tense, pure tense. Nobody was really safe. Every POV we got was a potential death and it, it was crazy. Um, uh, so many people died. It's, I mean, I think we're, we're, we're going to talk about it later, but I think my favorite and my most shocking moment was the betrayal of Bethel and Thomas. Um, I'm not sure if Thomas was really, uh, if he knew what Bethel was doing, but obviously he's going to back her up in whatever she's, she does. And it's just on point. It's perfect. I should have seen it coming. Bethel was always the one who was struggling the most and had the most and uh, was, was uh, crying about the most, about the sacrifice, about the past. And yeah, to get her sister back, I, I didn't see it coming. I, I, I didn't see it coming, but I should have. And that really hits me because I really liked her. and. Um, so many people died. It's Mora is dead. Silver Mob is dead. I mean, it's not Sylvan, but still. Uh, yeah, I, it's a lot. Overall, I love the chapter. What what kind of score would you give it? Ten out of ten. That was pure TWI masterpiece. That was uh, a ten out of ten chapter. I would definitely agree. It's 10 out of 10 for me too. I absolutely loved it. It was it was hard. You know, there was a lot of death. There was a lot of hard moments in it, especially the end where we're left on the super cliffhanger. We we want to know what happens, you know, right away, but we got to just wait and be patient. Mm-hmm. It's hard. But Hell rock. Oh god, I, I I got tears in my eyes. I love I think, that guy. Yeah, I, I it, he was probably the hardest death for me, I think, this chapter is Hallrock. Or you know, Hallrock and more, probably. Mm-hmm. Uh both of those were the hardest deaths for me. But other than that, I think my favorite scene or I guess like collection of scenes through this whole entire arc was um was the Fae plan to take out Kasigna, basically. Like, oh. I thought that was really well done, and it was just, like, it came together so well in the end. Yes. And I just liked how there were, like, so many twists and turns for it. I thought it was a great uh, a great scene overall. The Battle of the Fates. Mm-hmm. It was cool. Indeed. All right, let's get some people talking. I see Landray, you wanted to speak. Go ahead. Hi there. Yeah, that was uh an insane chapter. <laughs> um I was I was just shocked, like moment after moment. I honestly expect I like I didn't know who was going to betray us, who was going to be next. The Fama was just like a shot to my heart, like when that came on. Oh, sorry. Um two seconds. Um, yeah, uh, actually, I think I'll, uh, I'll stop talking because I think my mic is acting up, so I'll just type. <laughs> Sorry about that. I know, you're, you're okay. Um, we oh. can hear you, but it, it's, if you want to type it out, that's fine. Uh, no, I was just, all I was going to say was, um, 
yeah, that was just an insane chapter. I don't think I've ever sat and been ready for one of these reading through the entire chapter, two chapters, in like a day. It was uh, it was crazy. I, I don't know how to feel. <laughs> Fantastic though. Yeah, it was it was certainly one of those chapters where there's so much. It's overwhelming. And it's just like, wow, mm -hmm. how what am I supposed to do now? How I'm am I supposed so to angry. feel? <laughs> yeah. uh, thank you, though, Landray. Thank you. Edron, did you have a reply to that at all? No, it's it's OK. OK, okay. Um, Mr. Europe. Let's hear from you next. Yeah, this was uh, like amazing. It's per like the really had the stakes properly like escalated for what this was going to be, and like so, I don't know how to really put it into words. Just uh, just absolutely oppressive in uh, like how much horror there was really and yet it didn't feel uh, contrived when they managed to beat it like when uh, they managed to fight back and actually uh, do stuff not just when like the final fate plot but the whole uh, thing where everyone was just fighting back in various ways just uh, it was very well done all of this was properly set up, I felt, and uh, yeah, I just enjoyed it a lot. There's obviously some uh, glaring things missing still, but according to Pirate, we're just halfway through this uh, solstice, so uh, yeah, I loved it all. <laughs> uh, you have a specially favorite moment, quote? Uh, favorite moment has to be Fetohep, probably. Um, oh. The Fetohep, like, uh, with his contingency to kill himself or to have Elkid kill him and then managing to, with the throne, uh, pulling him mm -hmm. back. It was just really good scene. Like, there's a lot to choose from, but that's the first one that resonates with me as favorite all my other favorite scenes has too many people dying <laughs> oh my god savage why are you people so savage i don't i i would have been happy if nobody died no but, but all no, the others no. that's why they're not my like i can't say it as my favorite scenes because there's a bunch of people dying in them <laughs> so i can't really say oh yeah that's my favorite scene when one of my beloved characters got slaughtered. Yeah, that doesn't feel great. <laughs> More doesn't deserve this. Whatever. Next. <laughs> yeah. Hi. Right. More is. Ugh. It's hard. Yeah. It's hard. All right. I'll I'll read out some comments now. Thank you, Mister Europe. Donkey Twenty Twelve says last chapter we ask where is X character, where is Y character. And every one of those questions was answered this chapter. Quite a few controversial twists this chapter, but I'm fine with most of them. Some I think I'll need to see what happens next. Judge, like the twist at the end of part two. Oh yeah, absolutely. It's it's impossible for us to judge it right now. And this is like the this is like the worst part and the best part of web serials in that you know the ending of a volume, the ending of a book. It, it's always it's it's normally the most climatic time yet for web zero we always have to wait and see as it's released and it's just hard to it's hard to get an accurate picture right away relia says my favorite scene maybe was when fedelhep was sitting on the throne and refused to bow to Kasigma. basically threw away all the air artifacts in his vaults to protect Aaron. I was so scared he was going to unalive right then, because then it would mean Perworthy would have to fight the Prophet on her own, but then he didn't. Smiley face. Also, OMG, he gave proof that Aaron is a citizen of Kelt and implied she was maybe a bit more? Shocked face. Also, also, it was so funny when the jaws were loosened and for five seconds, Floss was like, um, Fiddlehip, what the frick? 
Also, 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 if Aaron is a citizen of the Celt, does that mean that Celt versus Rochal will happen if she gets kidnapped there? How will that work? Uh, shocked face. Who knows how that will work? We have to wait and see. <laughs> wait and see is basically what I'm going to be saying, like, this entire discussion. I can already mm-hmm. feel it. I... And that Aaron is a part of Celt. I mean, Fida have... Fidab also, um, if I recall correctly, he wanted to make her his successor, so that she's at least a citizen of uh, Keld is a given, I think. When mm-hmm. he wanted to make her his successor, she could have been queen of Keld. My fucking goodness. <laughs> she could have been. Who knows if she will be at one point? Maybe. <sighs> All right. Sir Bear says nine out of ten. The minus one is because I have a problem with Feta, with Feta Hep's scene. Felt too much. It felt like too much. It felt like Pablo was hammering us with hey, Feta Hep got contingencies to die. He got so much of them, and then none of them were triggered, and none of them were used against the Jaws. Felt sad to have so many Chekhov's guns, and none of them were fired. It felt like a waste of a scene. I definitely disagree there. I absolutely loved Fetal Hep scene. It was it was really great. Uh Sir Bear also says Sanctuary Ends is probably the best part. I loved those scenes too. Those were really tragic. Yep. It's like we got all these beach scenes and now they're never coming back. The beach is never coming back. It's gone <sighs> forever. Forever. And it's just perfect. I mean it's Trapping people, hey, it's trapping so many undead there and just sending them back to wherever the sanctuary is coming from. Sanctuary ends, it's... Uh, you you really felt every sanctuary end like a loss. It really is a loss. Every room, every... Yeah. It was awesome. Yeah. It was great. Well, it was. I always say, I say it's great, but I don't mean it's. It was good that that happened. It was just, you know, it was a great scene. All right, continuing with reading reactions. McChuckle says more dying hit me the hardest. The necromancers and sanctuary end scenes were my favorite. Overall, I liked the chapter a lot. I really loved the additional scenes like Tyrion's and the ending scene. Glad you liked it. I agree with everything you just said. Lan Ray says, No one felt safe at all. I kept thinking, well, maybe one or two side characters. We lost entire plot lines here, as well as heroes who deserve their happy ending. My god, the half-seekers. I love them so much, I have since their first appearance. I don't know if anyone hated the half-seekers. You know, I think a lot of people loved them for a long time. So seeing... It's it's impossible to not like the half-seekers, how they are written. Yeah. I mean, more, more this gentle giant, just being thankful that he's uh, that he is uh, allowed to be in an inn and nobody looking down at him. How he's taking care of Mercia. Oh my God, I'm uh, I'm starting up again. <laughs> God, I hate you, pirate. <laughs> yeah. Oh, it's so hard. All right, Mystical Pie says this was an incredible chapter. Favorite moment was Fettelhep. I love Fettelhep, but almost wish he died because his credibility and standing in the world is going to crumble. And I don't see how Kelt is going is able to continue. Would have been an incredible send off for him, but we'll have to watch him and Kelt suffer throughout the next volume. And said also Halric and more sad face. I so obviously Fettelhep has some problems right now. You know he's. He's expended a ton of his arsenal. His undead are gone for ever and ever. And Kettle Hell, uh, or sorry, Kelt is at the weakest it's ever been. But I think this is the point where, you know, they can st- still keep going down. But I do think, and I hope one day Fettel Hep will turn it around once again. We'll see how it goes. Valtherain says, we lost a lot of people this chapter with suffering, but also hope Caligma was the greatest threat, and she is out of the picture. As a plus, Celt may have a chance since Celt's soul should be free now. Celt's soul would be in Helsty, though. And, you know, the 
a whole point of what you know Kilt was doing was focusing on Casigno itself. So I don't think I don't think Kelt to being free matters for for Kelt. Um, Landry says, if you're the prophet, we'll use this to crusade against Kelt and turn it into some dystopian theocracy. It's certainly possible. It certainly is possible. Improbable Blob says, incredible chapter, probably the best that Pava has ever written. Best moment was Ki uh, Kasigna getting got. The phase plan was just so well worked. I do agree that Fellheb dying would have been a great send off, but if Pava has plans for his character, then fair enough. Orchant says, I really love the whole flex of Nerhavia. Tato Lord says, with any luck, the prophet got, got stomped on by a jaw and died. Yeah, that <laughs> we can only hope for that, but I don't see it. Um, why, uh, why May says, my only criticism about the chapter would be that the Reinhardt bindings felt like they came a bit out of nowhere. You've always known that the family is weird, powerful, and that they have a bit of a screw loose. However, the fact that Magnolia had apparently kept them all of them in check for half her life was a bit meh. And cliffhangers can go F themselves. <laughs> We're all struggling <laughs> with the cliffhanger. Don't worry. <laughs> it's all hitting us. Hey. Oh, hello, Asteria. Seems our third co-host is back. Well arrived. Well, it has arrived, sorry, yes. <laughs> Are you guys Thank still in general impressions? Yeah, we're just closing up. I'm going to read out Kel's and Mystical Pie's last response, and then Asteria, if you want to give your general impression, we'll then move on to our first question. Yes, I okay. will give them. Um, Kel have you says, picked out the first question? Nope, we have not, but let me read Kel's thing. Kel says, Sanctuary Ends was a fantastic sequence. It was tragic in that it was necessary, but it was offset for me by the hope and knowledge that that we're returning to the points of origin. Origin getting Pomley back was wonderful. The Dole Hands getting their generals key back with all the history stored there. Also, Nier's calling them in a vengeance dungeon had me cackling. Oh, yeah, that <laughs> vengeance dungeon part was so funny. Yeah. <laughs> so funny. Uh, yeah. All right. Mystical Pie says, I personally felt like this was an incredible reveal that recontextualized a lot of the story. We know the Reinhardts are snakes. It was always been a bit weird. The current generation of Reinhardts is current, entirely docile and mag lit Magnolia do whatever. Oh, she says, the chapter was too much. Listen to the podcast for me and Drag's secret opinion. Okay. We'll, apparently, we'll be getting some podcast uh, episode on this chapter oh, she soon. You sneak. You're supposed to be going through the, the wandering in sequentially. Ugh, they're oh. talking about the No Killing God, uh, No Killing Goblins podcast, by the way, for anyone who wasn't sure what that was about. Asteria, I think we're good on everything. So how about you give us your general impression and then we'll go into the next question. Uh, I suppose I, I'll keep my sort of general impression short uh for everything and there was so much that really happened <laughs> in in this this sort of pair of of chapters that that there is to talk about but um as i'm i'm sure i'm echoing many of you the ending kind of superseded everything else that happened and i'm i'm kind of having to like reserve judgment on how i feel about everything until we until we see what happens <laughs> as to the follow-up from that um which is i'm still of mixed opinions about how i feel about that because there was just so much that went on and to have one event kind of dwarf everything else was interesting at least uh but that wraps up my general impression wiggles Edderon, any final thoughts nope uh nope just, I don't want to talk about the first question, but I have to, because then I, I have figured to relive we would, it again. I figured we'd get it out of the way. I'm sure that there was a lot of discussion uh -huh. about this in general impressions. It's one of the harder topics that this chapter brought up. We might as well, you know, dive into the de 
not even the deep end. We we'll just we'll just dive into the endless abyss. Abyss. Yes. <laughs> um. So the the the, the question that that Edron is is wincing away from is so many deaths. Which one hit you the hardest? Uh, Wiggles, I'm sure you were kind of like twiddling your thumbs while Edron and I were were going on yes last week about about some of these characters. And I was like, the absolute death I did not want to see was Gershaw. <laughs> yeah, I remember that. Yes, um, <laughs> it's yeah. Gershaw you know died. My cheese night died. I I had been very upset about Hero and about Cell's grandmother, especially after finally reading the Horns chapter. And and then you know, like, cool. Like, let's just keep let's keep going and just just you know hit hit Asteria's Cryducks and and friggin' like Gershaw is gone. So. That was Gershaw, one that... <laughs> could have been something amazing. You know, he yes. he did so much this battle. He could have been amazing. It just uh, like Halric, more everyone else. Like I was, I was utterly crying. I was, I was upset. But like, I they threw themselves like, Ugh, just Gershaw, come, come on. The dude was the cheese knight. He just had cheese for everyone, and it was just this wonderful, amazing person. Out of all of the people who died, why him? Okay, I'm gonna, I'll, I'll stop there. Did you guys have any thoughts before we start reading off responses and hear from Mr. Europe? Uh, responses. Hellrock. I think if if I recall correctly, Hellrock was a was the first adventurer, I guess, wasn't he? The first adventurer who sat down and. Okay, in Syria, yeah, no, Syria was was there before him. Yeah, I think Halmark was the first gold rank. Yeah, the they first, were the gold, first rank. gold rank team. They so, they were the first maybe. people who brought attention to her in because high level people were were there, and just just recalling him completely down and getting cute by the flowers. And now, oh my God, Herak had, had such a good arc. I, 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 I can't, I can't start this again in my head. Uh, you can, yeah. you can go next, Wiggles. Yeah. Um, oh shit. It, it, it's Halrak and Moore were definitely the two that hit the hardest. I knew that going into the solstice, I had predicted that. Um, like losing half or more of the half seekers was like one of my prime predictions because that would just hit me the hardest. And I seeing more dead, seeing Elundi, Elundi um, dead for sure. Like those are the two we know for sure. Jellicua is up in the air right now, but she could be dead. But more in Lindy her for sure, and it just it hits super hard. I was so sad seeing Morgan, just like that the gentle giant who turned to revenge in volume eight and you know kinda twisted himself into knots and never really got through that even into volume nine and just seeing him gone now, it's sad. It's really, really I don't... sad. I don't think Jaquel is gone. She yeah, might die I, after the battle. She might die in upcoming chapters. But I don't think yeah. she's, she's dead right now. I, I, I would agree with you because, you know, we had a list of um, the dead and it specifically listed Moore and Lindy, but not Jalakwa. So I, I would have to agree with you that she isn't dead right now. I think, if you recall, one of my favorite scenes from the last chapter was the, the blood bank. And um, Yularon with basically playing the Red Cross. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I don't know if Pirate's going to do this, but I would imagine that one of our post solstice chapters, part of it, is going to be on the aftermath. You have people who are not dead but are dying. And I would imagine, in a sort of more realistic kind of uh, battle, which is what this was. We are going to see characters that are not dead, but we're going to lose them because there's no healing potions. Mm -hmm. So we're we're dealing in like the first major I post loss of healing potion battle, and I think what we're we're going to see is Why um is, is is some loss of some of these characters 
in the blood room, you know, with trying to be treated, but they're just not going to make it, would be my guess. Don't give them ideas. <laughs> I, I can just see it. I can just see it. We know Do Pirate me. Watch. We know Pirate Watch MASH. They have that as a reference. That's one of the biggest plot points in MASH. In fact, like two of the key episodes in MASH are about like characters who are like, they're good, they made it. And then like you learn about they're dead. Like, what? <laughs> like I don't even know what it is. It's but, a TV so, show. But it's people... a TV show about um, caring for, for victims post battle. And oh, that's, oh, what, that's what I expect is going to happen to characters like Jaquela. That's not what MASH is. Why are you lying there? <laughs> I know. That's exactly what MASH is. Ignore that person. You, what's it, Oshi? All right, all right, all right. All right. All right. Calm down, right. everyone. Okay, Asteria, I, I do agree with you that I think that's actually what part of the epilogue is going to be about, is going through, and maybe not necessarily seeing people die from their wounds, but just going through and seeing who has died, who is left over after the battle. I think that's what the epilogue will be for you know we could lose some more in that too you're absolutely right that would be very very realistic oh this is gonna break me okay yeah. so with that said and all of the feedback from the hosts any non-host needs to ping to talk mr europe what are your thoughts so uh like the first would be like the most tragic for me honestly wasn't Hallrock or more uh like they were really sad of course but kind of felt like it like kind of like I accepted it the most tragic ones for me honestly was Doln and Yuland cuz Doln just as part of the story is like every Chaldean's plan just falling apart and just all the important people dying it was just, and then Dolan just getting killed like that was just so sad, just so sad. And then Yulind, of course, just uh, like the fan who joined them in and just is the always kind of like on the back foot and just, especially since she didn't even want to give her death flag and Jalakwa uh, forced her to give it like no no go on give your death flag so I can so he can die um, but for me the saddest one uh, was actually Alcaz when Piver when he tried to get Piver to be a decent person uh, like by appealing to friendship and uh, Piver just being a total asshole Yeah. yeah. Piver. Dang. He was. What a. Uh, what, what, what can you even say to that? It's just. <laughs> All right. Moving on. Yes. So, oh, uh... Kylera says, is he still alive? Kind of wonder if Kasinga gave Fedohap life. Uh, and then they leave these quotes. Yet remember this they have never found life more intolerable than death. His lungs moved for the first time in centuries as Fedohap took an unconscious breath. I thought Fedohep was alive again. And now he's dealing with both the prophet and being at war with all of the countries that the Undead attacked. Wiggles, any insight? Edoran, thoughts here? I doubt he's alive. Like, I don't nope. I don't read that as him being alive alive. That's, that's I think just me, that, though. I think that breath is... Uh, what's the English word? Um... Why are his lungs moving then? Yeah, it's it's a reflex. It's just I, I think he was and he he acts like he is an undead and I think this lung movement was involuntary. It was really he's so That's... distressed that he even like took an unconscious breath even though he doesn't need it. I read it like this at least. Okay, I'm going to disagree here because unconscious breath to me means that his body is like, I need air to breathe. And so when you're breathing, most people don't think about it, right? You just breathe until you, you start realizing and then you, you you know, are thinking about breathing for a while. But I think Fedo helps back to life. And I think that's part of the reason that he lost complete control. I mean, I know he didn't have really control of the undead, but the undead 
were totally gone. So um, I think Fedo's back to life, which I, I guess we haven't. Have you guys talked about our favorite um, suicidal general? Not Strategist? Yet. Not yet. <laughs> Not yet. <laughs> so, <laughs> anyway, so Fedo Hub, I think, is back to life. Um, Sidehammer says Halric, Moore, and Gershaw hit the hardest, but they're on copium for more since uh, Uland was seen in the Land of the Dead, but Moore was not. I'm pretty sure Moore was seen in the Land of the Dead. Am I wrong? He was. Sir Bear um, quoted just below where okay. Moore is mentioned. Uh, and Probable Blob says gotta be Moore. Sir Bear says Moore is dead. Valthrunet. Valtheran? Valtheran. Valtheran. Yeah. Okay. Valtheran says, Chikela wasn't there. One can hope. Uh, Rila? 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 Rila says, Tursk was one of the things they didn't think would hit so hard because his queen clearly was devastated by it and also thought he... And also he thought that he'd be saved when he wasn't. It made all of the ants really scared around him. Also because he was such an unsympathetic ant when we first met him, and seeing him earnestly take on Aaron's values and then being unalive where it really makes uh, them feel like the solstice set the armored ants on the same path to ally, uh, uh, becoming allies with the free ants, whereas the flying ants are going against them, which makes them wonder where the rest of the highest will fall in the ant civil war. Also, also seeing Ulyaya Unalive was super sad, too, because she proved that just because you're an old hag doesn't mean you're an old hag if you catch their drift. Also, 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 Frick Pivar. So, Ulya, yeah, that was another one that hasn't really been brought up, but jeez. She was... Hey, that was which... a brutal death, too. She, a yeah. Brutal one. Oh. But man, like, she was one of the cool witches, too. God. Yeah. So uh, that was kind of like uh, that was a nice nod to like what's been going on with Lakin's crew that we haven't really seen, but you know, an older character that's been around for a while. I wouldn't have minded those... Lakin died, but why she? Why her? I would have minded Lakin dying. <laughs> no, I wouldn't. I would. Why he's an ass and he's German? All right, uh, Wiggles, do you want to read Blonde Rays? Sure, I'll read out the rest, then we'll, then we'll get to Oshi. Lanre says, Gershaw wasn't mentioned in any of the lineup of the dead. He was named by the system as being a true hero. I suspect he isn't dead and gained some sort of survival skill like the linebreaker. You're right, he wasn't mentioned dead in the Deadlands. But, you know, as Pierre quotes, narration says corpse. So, it's... I do think it's much more likely that he is dead, but you're absolutely right that we don't know because we didn't see him at the Deadlands. He gone to the other place. Dio Trio. Or Dio whatever Trio. Whatever it was. Yeah. yeah. I mean, you also have to remember the point of views that we got in the dead, Deadlands were Halric and Der Dervish. I think Dervish. those are the only two. So if yep. they don't really know Gershal, they're not going to pick him out amongst everybody else. And Gershal could have also gone to the Angel Land, so yeah, that could also be another reason why they didn't see him. Yep, it's it's up in the air for now. That would be interesting to finally see a POV from that place. Mm -hmm. Oshi, you wanted to speak. Uh, stuff happened. It was bad. No, no, I won't do it. Um, I talked a lot about like which deaths affected me a lot on the podcast, but uh, I'll do it again for you guys. Um, I think on a personal basis, not on like what's the most epic ones. Olialia was one of the most epic ones in Gershals, but what really hit me is the non-death of Chaldeon. I know you said death. Technically, it was an attempt at death. Oh. Um, Chalian's attempted self-mutilation versus what happened. It was a really cool parallel between what happens with Fedohep in 6.56 6 
and what happens with Chalion in 6.57. So you have this epic scene with Fedohev where he sets up his own sacrifice. He's going to die, he's going to lose himself, and he does it for duty, and he does it for his people, and he does it because that's the right thing to do, and that's what he is. Uh, that's Sorry, that's what and who he is, the King of Kelt, uh, living the legacy of that person, that being that he's trying to embody, Kelta. Um, sits at the throne, it's all sacrificial, and what ultimately stops him from dying is not a curse, is not a negative thing, it's his people. His people reach out, the name sewn into his robes. It's the belief of every single person in Kelta, in Kelt. They wanted him to live, so to keep his duty, and he wanted to do the same. And because he's mortal, and because even as a revenant, he's still the king of Kelt. He matters, and so he stands against death herself and says no. Very mythological, very Greek, Hindu, whatever you want to go back to, like ancient mythology reflection. And then you see the parallel straight across to what Chaldean did. Chaldean is a strategist down to the um, the last moment. His his purpose has always been the duty of protecting the Drakes, ensuring their continued prosperity, their life. He defends them, but he does it in a way that's so diametrically... It, the purpose is the same, but it's such a different methodology. And he wants to die. He wants to die, but he does it in a way that that will have the heroes who would follow him die, the stupid ones die, and the ones that survive will have like high levels and they'll be able to do stuff. And the smartest ones, the ones that he wants to train and to lead, will will survive and they'll keep it. And he's trying with his last breath to stamp his own legacy onto Palas and the Drake nations as a like nation cities as a whole. Only the the smart ones survive. Survival is all that matters. Nothing else is as important as that. You have to be smart. You, it's your duty is to survive and grow and keep the Drakes alive, whatever the method. If it means sacrifice, so be it. And he cuts himself up and tries to die, and Kasigna sees through it and just goes like, "Bitch, no, suffer." And she leaves him with the curse that he will not die. It, it's not explicit, but that's her will, and she's a god, and what she says in that moment will happen. So he's not going to die. Despite his best efforts, he's going to be alive, and he's going to see his reputation in tatters, the people he's killed, the folks who he wanted to succeed him, uh, wanting to succeed him, Dulm dies for him, like, all the things. There are a hundred ways he could have done it, but he chose that way. He always chooses, thinking he knows what's best, what needs to be done, and he doesn't let, like anything else happen. And I think the parallels of those two really hits very, very well because it it represents everything about the individual themselves, the nations in um like how how they work, the choices they make, and how the undead nation of Kelt is believes more in itself and in its people and its rulers than any Drake has ever believed in Chaltian. And he could have been something different, he couldn't. And in the end, he's scrabbling alone in the dark, not even his granddaughter to comfort him, because she's busy doing the one thing he wanted her to do. So that I was think, fun. Yeah, no, I think you make some really good points about Chaldean, and I think Wiggles and Edron, you both thought he was out, right? Like, ditto. Yeah, um, at the start of that, when he went in, I did think he was going to die. Or, wait, are you... Yeah. He yeah. got the opposite, like Oshi said. Um, I'm not sure if his, if the curse will last when Kasigna is really dead. We can hope that maybe that bro is, is breaking the curse and he can die now. But if Oshi is right and he's really just now this husk 
it's it's gonna be harsh for him. It's gonna be. Not... He he's essentially like the worst kind of immortal, right? Like you have the old yep. like oh she said the old Greek tales. I forget the exact uh, myth, but you're immortal, but you didn't wish for eternal youth too. Mm-hmm. So you're clarify one thing. Hold on, I didn't say he was yeah. immortal. It's just that he won't die in that battle. That's all. That's the okay, worst. Well... He doesn't get the death he wants. He gets the death he doesn't want. Yeah. No, so I, I, I'll take it the step further, though, and say he's essentially immortal. and But he's got a broken body. His reputation is potentially in shatters. His mental health is gone. I, it, whew, talk about long-term curses. I don't think, um, Edderon, to your point, because Cigna's not dead per se right she's back to being less than non-existent status wow. that they kind of all arose from so her curses can stand but you know and she could eke her way back in like i don't know ten tens of thousands of years but the whole kawan's whole point was like you know do a nothing existence but her curses will stand mm-hmm. um her curse on like right so you've got whatever's going on with feto hat you've got Chaldean's immortality, essentially. And then you've got the two death curses on Oberon and um, the Ant Queen as well. So, all sorts of horrific stuff. Uh, Wiggles, you want to read off the final thoughts? Yeah. Let me just read these and then we'll get to the next question. Justice for Silvermop says, I'm really worried about Jalakva dying properly now or later because I think she will become part of the wasting storyline. I thought she would for a while head that way, but it didn't seem see I did I didn't see how till now. Thinking about how she has to spread out in a body and her limbs being disintegrated. Morchin says, I thought Peroran and Red Scar dying was horrible. We don't know if either of those characters are dead Morchin, so hopefully they're not. We'll see. Courier says Fedo reconquers Kelt Pog. Sahala says Redscar and Porin may not be dead, but Rife lost her le- lost her wing and Dragonlord of Waves is confirmed dead. That made me sad. Well, he's dead, but you know, he's leader of Diotria. It seems like a good deal for him. Lanray says I wonder if we will be going to Hell's D at some point. Maybe the Antinium can summon them using Heaven as a conduit. Seems like a lot of plot points waiting there. Could be. Could be. All right. That was the... So just just to, like, speaking of Palast, that was the one thing that did make me super upset about Halric and, uh, and Moore and some of the others. Like, we know their souls still exist. They're in Palast. I think we're going to be seeing more of them, just in the Deadlands. So they're not, like, gone forever, like poor Dravesh who got unmade. Uh, it but go ahead. Have, yeah, it could, but it's... But I think it's this, unlikely. We also this, know that the system said... Bed. Go ahead, Adrian. Yeah, no, just that they are now surrounded by trulings of goblins. And I have less, oh, it's <laughs> and, and there are ways for people to come back from death. We know that there are ways that they've they've been able to work their way back to life. So I have hope for Halric. I don't think he's done yet. Oh, all right, out of, all right. Out of all the characters, all right. But moving on. Yeah. Traders. Let's move on to our second question, and this this is a hotly debated one, I think. Um, mm-hmm. Or just we know who our traitors one. are. Yeah, traitorous scum, flying queen, and Bethel. Is there any chance of them surviving? And what will they do if they survive? What is Bethel's next step if she gets out of this valley alive? What is, what is the Flying Queen going to do? What did, what did the Flying Queen get? We know that Bethel got her sister back, but what could have convinced the Flying Queen to do something so monumentally stupid? Um, Edoran, Asteria, either you have a thought, otherwise I'll just go ahead I... myself. I would just open this question up to, like, were you surprised by who the traitors were? Because we had the discussion about who's going to be a traitor, if anyone. And we were making predictions, and I just... Flying Queen and Bethel were not on my list. 
<laughs> At least one person in here. One person. One person thought about Bethel. I can't. They, I, I, I can't remember who who it was, but somebody predicted Bethel. Yeah, I um I think they also predicted the Flying Queen too. But yeah, it's it Bethel, you know, makes it sense. makes sense in the yeah. end because Bethel has always cared a huge amount about her family and she's always been very fickle you know she she'll do whatever she feels right no matter the cost and this is just something that feels right for her i guess and it's hard for us to accept accept that mm -hmm. i don't blame what? her honestly like i don't blame her for the the choice I don't I, I think if she does survive, I like I think she's cut a lot, like she's lost a lot of friends, she's lost a lot of contacts, but there are people who are gonna side with the gods. And I do Oh sorry. No no go ahead. I, I just I don't think she I she's down a new path, but I I don't think people are gonna kill her for making her choice that she made. I do blame her because she should know that her betrayal is going to cost other people, their sister, their brother, their mother, their father. Other people are going to lose their family because of her decision. And she should know that. She should know how it feels, how it is. And um, that's why I can blame her. I'm sad because she was probably my, one of my favorite, she was probably my favorite noble of, of, of everybody. I always enjoyed her when, when she was there, and now that's all gone. I can just see a fucking traitor now, <laughs> and it's, it's, that's crushing. What I can't understand is the Flying Queen, because it's not logical to betray them. Because everybody is gonna fucking hate you, and everybody's gonna come for your head. Even, okay, well. I mean... <laughs> okay, so for yeah, the Flying Queen, first off, she's always been characterized as an idiot. Like we've seen we've seen her do stupid stuff a lot. But the other thing is she just the queens themselves just do not think of the other races as like allies in that kind of sense. They don't real they're already enemy number one of all of Israel. So why should they care if they betray the other people, you know? It's kind of their primary <sighs> thought. And only the free queen has really turned around on that thought in mm -hmm. a significant way. The other ones are still no. They're just like, no. We don't care about anyone but ourselves And at the end of the day. Alright, but thank you both for giving some thoughts. I guess we'll start moving on to people who want to talk. Um, Sir Bear, what did you think? Sir Bear? Lost in action. Uh, move on to Lonray then, and we'll circle yep. back. Lonray, what did you think? Uh, it was very interesting, but I genuinely think that the Free Queen might have been stupid enough to be tricked. Um, I would guess that she asked for Antinium back, or possibly um, Bel Belsferreda, or whatever the name of the original queen was, um, which wouldn't be a soul that Consigna would have. Like, she might have even done it on the promise of someone being brought back that would not have been. I think that she is going to be killed by the other queens. Um, just out of principle for siding with a god. If she isn't, I imagine that rear uh, centinium that's left, the bard, might make an appearance on Israel at some point, and he would definitely kill her for siding with their enemy. Yeah, it's, it's something that was just like, we need to know what she got out of the deal, I think, to properly contextualize whether or not the other Antinium will um, will come after her for it. Because if she got something crazy good out of the deal, they might not even care, simply because they don't understand who Kasigdom really is. This 
could be the big split, and it does lead into my fear that the Rochal slavers are using the Antinium as a base to take back the people they kidnapped from the inn. That's um, certainly possible. Like, that that just makes sense from what we know. Which would lead to that big split of Israel against the Antinium, or at least against the Hivelands Antinium. Possibly of the Armoured Queen siding with our side, and the uh, Twisted at the fore. It could also lead to the Free Queen dying. Because we know the Free Queen is destined for death now. She's like, death-touched. And so, she is going to die. Who knows uh, when that will be, but she will die. Uh, that does, yeah, I guess Bird would have to take over at that point, much to his disgust. Uh, not to get too off topic though, so I'll uh, I'll end that there. Yeah, um, Bethel as well was um, was a shock, but one that made sense, made complete sense when she explained her reasons. She's completely impulsive and just wanted her sister back and didn't think of the consequences. I think she's dead. I think she's going to get killed uh, by Magnolia, and that will be a big thing, or possibly one of the others, maybe even Thomas. That'd be, man. It's so sad because Bethel's been with us for so long, and she was mm -hmm. like one of the coolest people to the goblins in the inn. Mm -hmm. Pink knights. Yep, the pink knights. And you think she's gonna get Jon Snowed by her own husband? Uh, uh so. <laughs> I I think she genuinely could, but I don't think the sister will die. I think the sister. I think maybe Bethel will buy the life of her sister. By killing herself, like full on seppuku. Uh, <sighs> it's harsh. I'm, right. Yeah, it's another question. Never mind. Yeah, of course. Um, thank you, Lanray. Thank you. Let's move on to Sir Bear, whose mic seems to be fixed now. Test, test, you are me? Yep, we hear you. Okay. So I was going to talk about the Flying Queen, but everybody talking about her, so. Let's pull out my copium. I think Bethel will survive. With the Reynard being free and probably go, going to full vengeance on Mayona for what she did to her own family, I think some of them will probably protect Bethel. And Bethel got with one big advantage in the north is that she got probably the best knight order in all of Israel. The the the, the pig knight or equivalent to the knight in Tyrandia, they are really good. They are heavily armored. I don't see Thomas betraying her wife. He, if the if the knight the, uh, still uh, still are still protecting her, despite uh, Betel not being honorable and being a traitor, her husband w will follow the will of of her wife of his wife and protect her. So maybe maybe Bethel will die, but that's I think that's volume eleven or plus thing, not volume ten. I I I definitely agree with you, Sir Bear, in two ways that Thomas I I do not see Thomas ever betraying his wife. Nope. No, okay. he, he, he's a carpet. He's a living carpet. He obey every. Okay, no, okay, no, I don't. I wouldn't go don't that far. Don't call him a carpet. Better say something. He obeys. D -d 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 no, 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 no. Don't don't say it like that. These these two are Bonnie and Clyde. They are just. No, they're uh, not Bonnie and Clyde. They're not criminal for once. And... No, uh, you know, I mean, they these two are just. On for the white, no matter what the other one does, They're the other loves. one is gonna support them. Yeah, yeah, th they should have that water. They're, okay, so, but yeah, I agree on that, that I don't think he'll betray him. The other thing is, you know, I've seen a lot of people say that they think Bethel is just dead. And I, I disagree wholeheartedly. Nope. I think Bethel is getting out of this battle. Like, absolutely getting out of this battle. She's gonna be a plot point moving forward. Maybe not V10, may, uh, maybe V11, but she's going to be a plot point going forward. Be because, Consequences. Yeah, because, right. because one, big factor, one big factor for Bethel is that the North is a mess. Uh, a multiple army dies in Liscor. 
the uh, Tyrion got uh, uh, ba ba battle also in Elendemir, so he lost soldier. There, there's okay. sickness, there's plague, there's uh, there's the rain out free. It's a mess. We're gonna keep this moving forward. So I know you guys, we have a lot to <laughs> discuss, and Bethel is gonna be a, a major point of contention coming oh up. My gosh. Dunky2012 agrees with you, Sarah Bear, saying the north of Israel is about to have Reinhardt chaos, which Bethel can use to sneak away. Uh, Flying Queen they don't know about. Sahalis says they think it depends on who the Flying Queen brought back. Uh, could she have asked for one of the Antinium who died to the Kraken, like Guac the Builder, uh, or Amazing Shaper Queen? Improbable Blob says the Flying Queen had us a chance. Bethel is doomed. Valtran says the souls of those Antinium were never in Casignal. Caligma wouldn't be able to bring them back. So then we've got Rila's thoughts. Bethel is going to unalive because Mag's having her as an underling, being one of the only inworlders to take Caligma's offer is honestly embarrassing, but her younger sister will probably live because there's no way that the only human to truly be brought back from Casignal would just lose her, lose her life immediately. The Flying Ants will lose the Ant Civil War, which will someday happen, but unlike the Grand Queen, who won't uh, because she's prideful, like Casigma, also the Flying Queen will learn to capitulate and become a good person, kind of how, like, Pavir almost was. Also, it would be super funny if both Bethel's younger sister and whoever the Flying Ants brought back would both be really, really mad at being brought back. Also, if Bethel survives, it would be because Thomas unalives, which would be sort of a life-for-a-life life thing, which would be really, really tragic. Uh, and they are also betting 20 Monopoly bucks that Bethel runs towards the Goblin home. So on that note, Mr. Europe, what are your thoughts? Uh, I don't see either of them surviving for much. Like, if Rochal uses the Antinium tunnels to escape, and this is kind of a plot with Flying Queen and Grand Queen, that just sets up for me a Civil War ant, and that, like, Kulbikic is definitely going to go... I don't know if he's going to straight-up murder uh, Flying Queen... But he's going like he's going to be pissed as hell over this, and uh, he's technically above them in the hierarchy. <laughs> I just don't see it ending well for Flying Queen at all. Uh, and for the for Bethel, I disagree that she's going to survive for a later volume. I just don't see how she's like she's lost every single like she has no alliances with everyone except that uh, everyone who used to be allied with her now hates her and everyone she wasn't allied with still isn't allied with her uh that's <laughs> there's not really much she can't hide because then she'd have to uh, unless she loses the rose knights they're kind of conspicuous and the Rose Knights are kind of trash at protecting her since uh, Magnolia gives Bane weapons and has declared them to be, uh, like, dead. <laughs> like, or declared a, like, kill order against them. I just don't see how she has any chance of surviving. And unless someone is really, really stupid... Um, they kind of have to die, especially her sister. Like, I, uh, like, in order to, like, we've seen before that there's the whole Belavir thing about that you can't just make horrible deals and bring people back because that mm -hmm. gives too much power to these eldritch beings. And right, it's but the same Belavir is here. Have... a witch, whereas this is a goddess. Yeah, so it's worse. Uh, and uh, anyway, but the point is the like that's just the things I think. But like, what's going to happen? Uh, there's also the what I feel, and that's I think uh, there's absolutely no defense for Bethel. Like, if Flying Queen some somehow thought or got something out of it, or thought she could get like First Queen back. That would kind of make sense that you like that you could make an intellectual argument that this battle isn't as important and 
like freeing rear is their actual priority for their people who are dying there. But Bethel was literally just, oh, everyone's dying around here, but I have someone I like more. So I'm going to betray everyone and um, just fuck over everyone, uh, everyone that like cares about me, all my responsibilities, everything, and just not even remotely act like it's a big deal. Uh, I agree that she's like one of the oh, more I'm going to stop you there because we got to keep moving since we're coming up on our just say the last thing yep just i agree that she's one of the like favorite nobility and this is why everyone should from now on agree that nobility are trash and we need to guillotine them that's it (laughs) okay so if we've got a kara supporter in the house (laughs) um kara would very much agree with you on that respect for so at least some of our nobility uh, Valtheron says that the Armored Queen will certainly take offense with the Flying Queen for allying with the one who killed Tursk. As for Bethel, now every noble in the North will hunt her down. They think that Bethel will betray if Thomas died. This surprised them. Lacken, maybe if Doreen had died. Uh, Mystical Pie? So, the guys have very strong opinions on Bethel. Whew. Okay, Mystical Pie says Bethel and the entire Wachalis line, including her little sister, are definitely dead. Flying queen they're not as sure about because the Antinium do not have many queens. Whatever the flying queen got, it almost definitely was not a revival since the Rahir Antinium were absorbed by Sleepy and the Azulian Antinium are in Halest. Their prediction is she got shaping knowledge, specifically how to make flying real flying Antinium. They see one of three outcomes, or they see three possible outcomes for the flying queen. One, the queens decide that the flying queen made a masterful gambit and spare her because Kasinga's dead. Two, uh, she joins the Grand Queen of the Ant Civil War. Three, one of the Centiniums offs her for allying with her sworn enemy. All right. Now, there was a third traitor that not many of you have mentioned, but Morchen brings up that Rafima is, was an almost traitor, and with that, right, ousted Manus. Mario echoes this thought, saying, Rafima's almost betrayal was all really interesting, given it's the conclusion of the ideology and objectives that Manus cultivated on her. The scene of Lulf choosing to save her was a beautifully done scene as he chose to drop the whole Manus Kool-Aid and save someone from being the puppet of Caligma, but also from her predetermination as the one to bring dragons back. They think this will be a step into being free from the duty imposed by Manus. So on that note, any final thoughts, Edron? Um, I agree with that uh, statement. It's, uh, it, was, it was a beautiful scene. It's true. Did it surprise you that Raph was considering betraying? Uh, it was surprising, but it's also not surprising that she uh, didn't go through with it. Because we see her suffer, we, we saw her suffer before, and um, but not going through with this was also beautiful, and she should be forgiven. So do you think that uh, kind of the the feelings across the board here on the on the traders was we know what Bethel did, right? Why she made her choice. And it uh-huh. seems like a lot of people don't like Bethel because of the specific choice we made. Uh-huh. The jury's out with the Flying Queen because we don't know what deal she made. And for Raph, it's like, okay, you're going to bring back your entire species, but because she didn't do it, there's not as much like, ah, we don't quite blame you as much. Is that kind of how you felt with the traitor spectrum? You you could say that. I mean, even bringing back the entire species, I could have maybe understood that instead of just, I want my sister back. Mm. That's There's a big difference between those two. It's interesting, the degrees and how, the, mm-hmm. how people are going to kind of react. All right, so we're going to move on to the next question. Uh, both Wiggles and I have chosen. So, Edron, what do you want to see for our next discussion? Um, the second question about Halcyon, I would say. About the goblins? Yes, correctly. Okay. Uh, looks like Wiggles is copying that over. And then, Wiggles, do you want to read that out loud and share it? And then do you want to share your opinion, Edron, before we start turning to others? Uh-huh. So I'll read it real fast. Goblins literally outnumbered the sinners of Inworld and took over Helsty. Hilarious or tragic? What do you think, Adaron? 
I think it's both hilarious and tragic. I I did not. I mean, I kind of I kind of saw it coming because thousands and thousands of goblins die every day in in world. They're gonna that they're a hunted species on every continent, and them just taking over hell. It's it's just perfect. I I love it. I love every. I lo just love the whole idea that there are so many of them being killed that they can just take over an entire dead realm. Uh, and yeah. <laughs> whoever, whoever, whichever god or yeah, I, I guess it has to be whichever god designated them to be always put into hell. Really, you know, made a big mistake because mm -hmm. they. Like, I think anyone could have seen that if every single goblin went to the same place while only some sinners from other races came there, goblins would always outnumber them, like, 100 to 1, easily. And so goblins would always have the most power there. And it, you know, when we first learned that Helsty was, uh, goblins always went to Hellsty. It was like this big tragic thing because you were you think, oh, they're all going to hell. That means they're all gonna, you know, be tormented for the rest of their existence. And then we've learned that, you know, they can shape it themselves because the gods are gone, basically. So in the end it worked out for the goblins. Yep. But so it, it's now no longer tragic for me because goblins made it better because they could push through and they could get this place to conform to what they wanted. And and that's good. I like that. I like how Pirate Abbot kind of showed that goblins, even when they're kicked down to hell, they find a way. Uh -huh. they're, cool. they're good. I love goblins. They're the best. I can totally agree with your thought, with the uh, with the statement. Um, just, I, I mean, I can just, I can just see it in my head. People were always uh, talking about the goblin wars, seas and seas. I mean, these are millions, billions, and trillions of goblins who are just dying every 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 year, and. Uh, <laughs> I don't know if it was uh, confirmed already, but I have... I mean, I, I don't think we know why Goblin Kings are getting, like, mad all the time. It's a biological thing, I think we, are, we have been told. But I thought it's because they get the knowledge that all goblins are going to hell. I thought that's the reason why all of them are, like, getting angry. I think it's absolutely an aspect of it, but at the same time, I feel like we're still missing a piece. I, I just oh, feel, right. I just feel there's something else. That, mm -hmm. well, because why? On that, on yeah. that note, yeah. let's yeah. let people speculate. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay. <laughs> so, um, <laughs> Donkey, Donkey says, 20... oh, "Go ahead." Do you want to read it? No, okay, go ahead. <laughs> Donkey says both in terms of the answer to the question. Improbable Blob says this was super expected. So I will go with slightly funny. Why May says neither, considering the amount of goblins that have died throughout the history of the world. We know that Helsty was the destination for them, so the sheer amount is to be expected, in my opinion. Um, Donkey says what's really hilarious and tragic here is Wiggles' pronunciation of Helsty. Okay, I'm not going to even <laughs> bother dignifying that with the response. Relia says it's more hilarious because goblins finally get got one over on the inworlders. Weird face with the W. Though we do we though we don't know much about how their lives are there yet, it might suck a lot. I don't know. Though it's also kind of inspiring because this all implies that the gods thought that there would be more sinners from the other races of which to populate Helsty. So in comparison to their expectations that inworlders have in general been ahead of the moral curve somehow. Um, I think super that's happy an face. face. 
Okay, it's I, I, I refuse to say ooh face. Okay, <laughs> about that. Um, happy face with six chins. Sahala says it's not tragic. A lot of them just want a piece to live normally, a goblin town or an island. Um, now they have a whole realm. It's kind of beautiful. They're the, also the least likely to be bothered by the scenery or hard environment. I think if asked, goblins would have chosen this outcome. Donkey says, it sounds like the go a, a goblins all go to hell on accident rather than par on purpose. A technicality of how the rules were written. Uh, I doubt you write in that all goblins go to hell on accident. You know, I, I don't think that's an accident. Sir Bear says, at face value, it's tragic. Magic being born and going to hell for no reason. But as the saying go goes, tragedy plus time equal comedy. It's funny the goblins are the bench and leaders and the big boss of the place and pull the reverse of the normal life. Yeah, it's great. I love to see it. Love to see it. All right, Mr. Europe, let's hear from you. All right. Uh, I'm not surprised at all from like, as soon as we found out that all goblins go to hell, hell's the, uh, I feel like this was the natural conclusion. Like, oh, you're saying that these occasional calamities that rock the world and just conquer their way through anything uh, they're all hanging out in the same place uh, and only the worst of the worst go there as well yeah that's gonna end well for everyone that's not a goblin uh, but yeah the I don't see it as really tr tragic in that sense that obviously they were gonna take over and it's just funny uh, that they managed to seize their own realm finally after the whole thing with uh, the goblin lord uh, Rice, uh, Rice saying that, uh, like, oh, we're going to create a goblin land. And well, they have one. They just have to die first. <laughs> uh, but yeah, the the really interesting thing, of course, is that the this when it was revealed that this is where they all go after death, that uh, it's, I'm convinced now that obviously that was what made uh, the elves declare war on the gods in the beginning. Okay. Thank you. Um, thank you, Mr. Europe. Let me just read out a couple more comments. Donkey says, maybe not an accident, but not directly goblins go to hell. More goblins go to hell because they all blank blank blank. I I do disagree with that, Dunky. I I think it's someone wrote that all go, goblins go to hell mm -hmm. directly, not not because of a well. There could be a reason behind it, but um, I don't think it was an accident. It's definitely not an accident. Mario says gods don't like green. That's that that's. Reason enough to kill all the gods. Mr. Rip says they wrote goblins as having original sin. Okay. Uh, Did um, you notice, actually, on that note, Edron and Wiggles, um, that like some of the races were being referred to as like first child, second child? What was that just a nod to like the order that they were created in, or is that something we haven't seen? What do you mean? I, I don't know what you're talking about. When, exactly. when like, the gods and the fae were referring to some of the species, like the satyr and, and like, the goblins, like, they they just referred to them in a slightly different way. And I'm like, what do you mean first child or second born or whatever? Did you not pick up on that? They they talk about the goblins. Like, the fae talk about the goblins as, like, the youngest. And that mm -hmm. I've always taken to be because goblins are killed off before they ever can mature and well, we like their saw... whole society is killed off a lot. But like I, I, we saw that kind of speak continued by a couple different people through these, these chapters, last chapter and, and both parts of this chapter. I'll have to find it and point it out to you, but yeah, it could be about it. What? Edron? I've never, I, I've not, I've not thought about it. I'll find it. Okay. Um, I mean, it's not part of the uh, of the question, but when we are on Halcyon, we didn't have mentioned that Antinium uh, apparently built their own heaven in hell. And, yeah. <laughs> oh my god! So, so the ants, the goblins, <laughs> and everybody that was in Caligma's little hellscape, other than the souls that were dissolved, have all been pulled into 
Oh, I, just, okay. I just, I and, just, and, and it's a little bit of faith. It's just because the faith that they just started, I guess, that they even, it's even possible for them to build the heaven in hell. I mean, just the just the notion. I love pirate for this. That Antiniums build their own heaven in hell. It's just <laughs> perfect. It's cool. Also, I do want to point out to Donkey that um, Asteria pronounces Helsty as Heleste for some reason. I don't know how. Because and it, what's Edirin what it pronounces, literally says. Edron pronounces Helsty as Helesian. Okay, so apparently me saying it, how it's written, is it, the weirdest thing. I literally said how it was it. written. I literally, okay, we're not going to get into a discussion about pronunciations or we will literally be here all night. So, yeah. moving on. Um, Waime did say that they took the first child, whatever, as a kind of statement of how far they were removed from maybe being part of Avalon or the original species. Okay, so I'm not the only one that saw this. Well, I'll, I'll, but I'll find the quotes and I'll, and I'll, and I'll pop them up over to you in, in chat. Uh, but, so, um, and Courier says, yeah, it's not a solid, but even ants are newer. Uh, so, let's get to the big discussion point that we've been kind of putting off. Uh, Rochelle. <laughs> uh, just Asteria. Rochelle period. But, yeah, let's yes. just talk about Rochelle period, because that's like the whole end of the chapter. And yeah. That, yeah, so like that's, 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 this is the question, Rochelle, period. And then who is still in a position to fight? There's several discussion questions that kind of get at this whole end of the chapter. Um, some things you might consider are the horns. Where are they? What what's going on with them? Um, who the heck was the Knoll talking to? What were the explosions? Just all of this together is this discussion question. So whatever you want to chat about, this is this is it. Um, so on that note, Wiggles, it sounds like you have some thoughts. Yeah, I just want to say first off, let's let's take a let's take a calming breath. Let's not go too far into the what if Aaron is going to be a slave for the next 20 volumes and we get to see her slave life for years to come? Let's, let's, let's calm that down a bit. I've seen that kind of rhetoric in like every single part of the discussions for this chapter. And it's like, come on, people. Wait and see a little bit. You'll have some faith in Pirate Abba. Um, just breathe. Breathe in and out. Calm down. Try and take a step back. Everything's going to be okay. It's... I like how you're just automatically assuming everyone's going to completely... Listen, I, I've, been, <laughs> I've been reading comments on the Discord all day yesterday. I see comments <laughs> under the chapter. They're like, holy shit, Aaron's a slave now? I'm quitting. I'm leaving. It's like, okay. Calm this is why down. I said at the start, I am I just I have I have reservations and I am I am gonna just wait to see how the next chapter plays out. Yeah. <laughs> just just wait a little bit. That's all. You know, it obviously this is this is a hard, hard chapter that's gonna come up, I'm sure, for anyone to read. Like if if Aaron is actually captured, I'm sure this is gonna be one of the hardest chapters for a lot Volumes. of people to read. Volumes. Or volumes. If okay, I don't think it's going to be a volume. I really don't. But if it is, it will be the hardest volume for people to read. Yes, but right now, it would get the horns back to Chandra, though. Mm -hmm, it would. But right now, I just want everyone to, you know, not go crazy thinking about it. Not tear themselves apart thinking about how this could all go super wrong okay so on that note you have your warning you have your marching orders let's start theorizing um i think the biggest section part of that section that kind of really surprised me like we knew that they were if you did a search if you did if you're like me and did a control find for the names we actually did see um hints that this was going to go down uh, we had the Knowles name show up earlier in the chapter uh this i think explains where the random genie digins came from like you were wondering that Adiron, right like you're like where did these digins mm -hmm. come from and it's like well <laughs> now we know <laughs> yep 
So we, we have seen hints of this. It is there. Uh, go back and reread if you missed them. But I think the most surprising thing was the system warning her. That was epic. Like, what the heck? I thought that thing was neutral. <laughs> Behind you. Um, I just wanted to say I predicted it last discussion that Erin at the end of this volume is not going to be in her inn, that she is going to be somewhere else and we're going to get her level 50 skill and then she is going to be somewhere else. I predicted it and I'm still thinking it. Next volume, we're going to have Erin in Rishal. And um, I don't even think apparently that she is going to be made a slave, but they are going to try to get her to brainwash her because uh, we have the uh, just now returned leader of the slavers just pining over her like she is, I don't know what. And I don't think Eren is going to be a slave or whatever. And they're going to try to brainwash her and she's gonna just, just give them their solstice magic. And, uh, but she's not going to be on Israel at the end of the volume, I think. All right. So we have, all right. <laughs> we'll see. We'll see how your predictions play out. You've, you've been correct so far. <laughs> um, so hearing Wiggles, other than the warning, did you have any thoughts about end of chapter? Um, Right now, I've also saw a lot of people like guessing that it was like a teleportation scroll that um, I used that failed. I don't think mm -hmm. so. Like, um, so what happened was something hit next to Aaron. It puffed up a cloud. Aaron got up because it missed. She ran. Iert came to her, opened the scroll before she could get into the garden, and then she's knocked unconscious. So and Obama is also unconscious. Yeah, and then was that, the assassin unconscious too? We don't know. That that's okay. up in there. But right now I don't think it was a teleportation scroll. I do think that Aaron is captured. So I you know, it, it it's up in the air what will happen next chapter, but right now I think Aaron is captured and Rochal has the upper hand. So what okay. that means for the next chapter, we'll see. But that's what I where I'm coming from. Well, some thoughts from others. Uh, justice for Silvermop. Uh, Silvermop was another death that uh, was 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 widely mourned. <laughs> just, just pointing that out. Uh, but justice for Silvermop says Kilb um, is potentially in a position to fight if he's hypothetically starting going north after the incident he was involved in. So Kilb could potentially be on his way. Especially if, if they're headed towards the Antlands, um, he's fairly close, I think. Uh, so he could potentially get word from the ants and meet them, like, head them off there. So there, there is that route. Mr. Europe says, if we're fighting slavers, it's time for the horns to come back, rip tear until it's done. More seriously, they think we're just transitioning into a Mad Max Fury Road portion of the fight, and it's now a race to save Aaron rather than a siege. Uh... Uh, Dunkey 2012 was talking about Wiggles pronunciation again. Um, and then they say they're still hesitant to say much about Rashal and the twist at the end of part two, since there's so many ways it could go. Even what we've seen so far is vague enough that we don't really know what exactly what happened. Waimei says if we're getting a Rashal arc like V8 with Aaron being away from the end, there are going to be riots. Horn saving Aaron by intercepting the teleportation back to Rochelle through the crossroads is their guess. If not, a teleportation scroll and Aaron goes to Rochelle. Ugh. You could be getting your whole, like, chase scene. Like, people have been begging for a chase scene for a while. It, this could be it. Um, Sahela says, yeah, still set himself up uh, as his own side. Wistrom will be against him. Many people who don't like their kidnapping attempt question mark of Aaron will oppose them. Floss may oppose them and the gods, but they have tons of resources and are allied to BK. They could see the cross joining this side, maybe even Nerhavia. That's a good point. Like, out of all the people who are, like, running around on this battlefield, Nerhavia is there. And we know she has a thing for Eren. As soon as Nears finds out, like, I know he's at war, but he's a war-happy kind of guy. Like, 
I don't know if he can split his attention, but like there, He's there's gonna so go many. Mental. Yeah, there's there's so <laughs> many people. Yeah, that Aaron has allied with. Like this is, I think someone pointed it out. Wiggles, maybe you saw this, but just like yeah, still as much as he's like a fucking creepy creep he's smart out of all the people to nab why Aaron he has to know oh. that this is going to bring everybody down on him Aaron is the one he's wanted the most like he okay he's intelligent but he's also Pokemon collector extraordinaire and Aaron mm-hmm. is the shiny rare legendary Pokemon that has never before been seen she is his he she's one of his ultimate targets and he wants her no matter what. So he's smart, but you know, he has his own um he has his own reasons for doing this. I I mean he could be I, I will say that we could go an opposite route and maybe he's just trying to set up a meeting with Aaron in a private place to, because he knows otherwise that she would never talk to him. So maybe this is a whole attempt just to get her somewhere private where she has to listen to him. Like, it could be that. It, just a thought. It's just the worst way to do it. <laughs> yeah, I said yes, yes. But, like, it could be that, like, he just wants to have a conversation with her that she would otherwise never entertain. Yeah. I Maybe. Could be that. Um, okay. Uh, does anyone want to talk? Oh. Like, you guys are welcome to chat. I don't mind reading stuff out, but don't forget, you can always at me, Wiggles, or Edron, and, and speak. I'll read out the rest, by the way, Asteria. Okay. Just to give your voice a rest. Relia says, The horns are in a position to fight, presumably because they won the quest reward from finding the walled city of whatever and got something like a cool artifact for 40 levels each or something. Smiley face with 25 chins. Also, Aaron may be able to pull some strings on Chandra to get Kelt or Floss or the Shield Kingdoms to help her out. Uh, open mouth face. Also, also the GDI is going to be her bestie throughout this whole arc if she wants to not be a slave, which will also be the start of their romance arc, <laughs> seeing as GDI met Aaron in Chapter 1, Uwu, uh, Winky Face with 35 chins. Also, 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 Aaron in the Wishing Well. Oh no, oh no, oh no, oh god, oh frick. Sad face with 56 chins. Also, 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 oh my, jo- oh my god, the scene when Nears finds out about this. Holy heck. XD. Um, Sir Bear says that kidnapping just proved to me that Rochelle will be the main villain of V10. Donkey2012 says, I'm like 90 plus percent sure. Aaron won't have slave or slaver arc, maybe a prisoner of Oshaw arc, but they want to work with her, not directly in slaver. Well, maybe Yazda wants that, but he's stupid like that. I agree. So, I don't, also, go ahead, Wiggles. Go ahead. I was just going to say, I don't agree that none of Rochal wants to slave her. Like, I, I'm pretty sure all of Rochal wants to enslave her, but I don't that's think the just numbers guy does. I think the number guy wants, like, the people who are the ghosts, the former ghosts, I think water as an ally. Uh, I'm, I'm iffy on that because they're they're Rochelle, you know. If they can't yeah, have you and as an like, ally, I think and, they have like people that they're like, yeah, slave level, but like others that they're like, we want to work together with you, but we wouldn't enslave you. And I think for the ghosts, at least. For some of them, I think Aaron's kind of at that level, but others they consider less than equals, and they don't don't care. I'm not going to argue the semantics of slavers; like they're terrible. <laughs> but I, like I, this, this seems like a a antic, or like this seems this seems to be totally on Yazdil. None of the others. So Yazdil, yeah. When they are they are they are terrible people that they're not idiots. At well, least. Uh, I okay. don't think they are idiots. I, I depends on the. Listen, what is Rochelle's number one strategy for everything? It's we enslave know. the problem. Enslave the problem. Okay. Uh, yeah, but not as. Um, not not not. I, uh, I mean. I disagree with that. Look, look at. Look! Look at how uh, Nahavia is is, is talking. I mean. Okay, Russell changed after she she's gone. 
now it is maybe like this. But like uh, Nahavia would have tried to seduce or to take her uh, to to make her an ally instead of enslave her. We'll have to. We'll just have to see what happens. Yeah. I mean, as yeah. Mel also uh, pointed out, she also now like the Iron Vanguard owes her a favor, right? So like she. There's a bunch of people that are going to come after anybody who does anything to Aaron, whether or not they're distracted with other stuff. Like, who, like I think Wiggles, like what, like Wiggles says, we're starting to get into speculation territory. Let's maybe circle back around to stuff we saw at the end of the chapter and kind of like maybe talk more about that. Like the explosions that went off, who the hell was I talking to system warning Aaron Warning, Aaron. Was that system? Was it somebody else? We know it's not the it fake. It's not color text. It was I'm, okay. I'm absolutely positive it was the system, uh -huh. and that's like showing clear favoritism for Aaron. Clear favoritism. <laughs> but I think it's also more just surprise on its part. Like it was looking forward to that moment where it could give her these levels, and all of a sudden it realized, oh heck, something else is coming at you. And it got surprised and just kind of blurted that out, you know? Behind See, you. I think it would be so cool if next chapter we switch to the system's point of view. And it's, like, oh, trying to deal with the yes. fact that it, like, broke its own rules. And also, like, no, you need to all, like, get levels up, levels up to, like, go stop this from happening. Oh, yes. <laughs> all right, I'm going to finish reading off some of these yeah. comments and then uh, Mr. Europe wants to speak. Mystical Pie says, I'm trusting Pyro will pull this off. It seems like we're being set up to see the horns step in to arrive and fight Rochon. There's not enough information to really know what's going to happen at this point, though. But a frenetic chase starting with the horns running from the monsters in the crossroads and transitioning into the horns chasing after the slavers would be cool. Valtharian says, I would be surprised if Rochon band managed to get away with Aaron. There are still Terriarch tests of the horns, maybe. Magnolia's forces, Salus, the Solstice Knights, the Goblin is the free Antinium as Ryoka if she is not a target. Literally all the armies would try to save her. Even the Grand Design broke its neutrality to warn her. Mario says, I think Bird, but he's probably exhausted fi from firing the ballista. Also I wonder where the guns or explosives were used. More Chen um, says Rochal kidnapping Aaron is the beginning of Rochal's end. Rahavia, Flas, Fedo, and Jacana will team up to crush, crush Rochal. Relia says, also, by the way, I have a crack theory. What if Aaron gets as her capstone to be able to split in three like three of one? So only one of her aspects goes to Rochal and the other two stay in Lissor. This way, people stop, bitch. What the fuck? <laughs> Happy phase with five chins. Thank you, Relia. <laughs> um, Sidehammer says, I wouldn't mind an Aaron and Chandra arc making new friends without her strongest power, creating new in somewhere while someone comes to pick her up. It, it would be interesting. Though I do think more people would not like it than would like it. Especially so soon after Volume 8. Courier says, I agree 5% think it's stupid to try and enslave. Won't, won't be enslaved. All right. Mr. Yep, you wanted to speak about the system. Go ahead. Go ahead. Yeah, I just think like, the system is uh, like the development of it and the uh, like gathering different personalities and trying to become a person kind of is just so interesting. and. The best part about it now is just the absolute clear bias it has in favor of Aaron and just spilling out to the point that it's breaking its own rules. I'm 100% thinking that this story is just headed towards Aaron uh, literally like getting godlike powers uh, out of her being shipped with the system. And there's nothing you can say against that. <laughs> I, you're right. There's nothing I can say against that because I can tell you it's won't listen. Happen. But like, like, like Edward just said, it's not going to happen. Nah. Nah, the nah, system nah, nah. Uh, fits all of her criteria when she listed them for a potential romantic partner. Just 
Okay, that's true, but I still don't <laughs> see it. Everything system. Oh my god. Oh man. Uh, I can't believe this gained this this dirty ship has gained more followers over time. What that that wasn't even the first time somebody brought that up? No. This has oh been going on for god. a while. Anyways. Not bad. Um I think that is a good question to stop on, unless you either of you, a stereo redron, have another question you want to go um, into. We could do just just end with a quick round robin of like top three, like first three responses to what was like the coolest scene. Like there's so much we haven't talked about. We talked a lot about a sad stuff, like just most epic, most cool scene. What was it? Top three responses and then or first three responses and then cut it. Okay, yeah. Um, let's do our, everyone's coolest scene. What did you love the most? And cool. we're taking oh, the here. first first three. Yeah. Um, what do you what do you guys think? What what are your favorite or coolest scenes at around Asteria? Nerhavia, like the whole like I don't even see you chop everyone's heads off. That that. That was just like friggin' like yeah. yeah. It was it was a really cool scene, but at the same time, it it just told you so much about who Nurhavia was as a ruler. You know, it, it's like it's like that Hemingway where it's like tell a story in three words or less, and it was just like tell a story about this character with one skill. Yeah, like that's Nurhavia. <laughs> yeah, it was everything I mean... Nurhavia was. Now that just now that I've said about it, how she gave like Ryoka, Tyrion, and who else? Who who was the third one? The the um, the power, and then they got like all all the upgrades to their gear, and they just went in and started fighting. Yeah. Like, what the fuck was that? I I do what what was that? And it was cool. <laughs> yeah, it was awesome. But who was the third one? I I have Ryoka, uh, I have Tyrion. Who was the third one? Teltavarion. The unicorn. Ah, the yeah, t- yeah, ah, yeah, yeah. It's true. It's true. That that was my favorite scene. I think when it's come to awesomeness. Um, for me, my favorite scene was similar. One of my one of the coolest scenes, I should say, for me was also the the battle in the Greater Teleport area. But not not because of Tyrion and um, Ryoka and them, but because of just how Risveri acted. You know, it really showcased he's just like he actually cares a lot about um, mortals and people below him, despite bad bouncing them at every turn. And I just thought that was really cool character development for him. That was my coolest scene. I agree. He's just a giant Sundere. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. Um, anyways, I'll read off some of these responses. Relia says, Coolest scene was when the Mother of Graves was revealed to be a failed copy of Caligma. Mm-hmm. She's a, we've gotten some hints about that in the past, but it's very cool to get Cosigna's kind of confirmation. Why May says Fettel have to find Consigna defi- definitely because of all the r- reasons previously mentioned says talked about. Miss Europe says Magnolia's whole vibe throughout the solstice if- is that if that counts. Her pulling everything out and having no chill. Oh, I forgot. Just the the scene of Magnolia just holding the giant down with no effort whatsoever is mm-hmm. a really cool scene too. She's going to, now that um, Cassigna is dead, she's going to have those bindings available again. I wonder if like her plot moving forward is going to be in trying to rebind her fi- family for volumes. Landray says, Nerhavia has all the coolest skills, generational slap, instant evil guards, and now her somewhat racist skill. I wonder if she wiped out any of the lost species. 
I would not be surprised if he was like responsible for the la- the death of the last Jin. I would not be surprised at all. Um, but yeah, I think I think these are most of the answers. Uh, any other cool scenes you can think of, Asteria? Well, we got Venerhab, we got Magnolia. I mentioned Rahavia, so one more person, right? Just, just we could take one more. Res- from someone um in terms of other cool scenes that we didn't quite get to or talk about um i don't know i like uh, there's so much that happened in the chapter i'm just trying to think of any like little moments that we like haven't discussed um landry says remy's scene was really cool i honestly thought he'd escape we don't know if he did or not. I mean, yeah. he's being eaten by zombies, but he's not. We don't know if he's dead. We didn't see him in the Deadlands. That's that's like my um, that's my eternal refrain for this chapter. You didn't see him in the Deadlands. <laughs> we don't you know don't if he's see dead. Them in the Deadlands, they're still alive. Know, like, exactly, Edoran. Like, I mean, speaking of Remy, like he's an underutilized character. I really want him to see. Like, I want him to come into like the main focus. I hope he's not gone. Like, Remy's just such a cool character that we, he keeps losing all of the pulls. And I don't want him gone. I, I want more time with him, especially in Chandrar kind of coming into focus with the whole Rochal thing. So I hope he made it just, you know, with some scars. Uh, but that seems I, pretty, I, pretty I ex- I expect him to have made it. I do. Yeah. I really do. Sarah Bear says, when the last Jin died and the Stitch Folk revolt, uh, sorry if you already read that, Wiggles, I'm just going by noses. Sahela says, comment on Mag, she bound herself and that's why she wasn't ruthless in Astelia and the last decade, now she will be. She showed this against Bethel. I'm surprised nobody didn't comment on the scene. I think nobody has been a pretty big Mag's like, why the hell has she not done anything? What the heck's going on with her like power stuff? And now we, now we have an answer. Um... Kel says Terry Arkin with Caldras and reigniting the heart frame breastplate. Wasn't that last chapter though? That was last chapter, but it was still awesome. Was that was still still, awesome. that was still very cool. Yes. Um, all right. So I, I've gone over my like limit of three responses. Uh, but I Brack Giraffe was... says the Cheese Knight's last stand. Sahela says Gold Noel Necromancer and Regis hiding behind the Gnoll. Oh yeah, that cat. Oh, that cat! We didn't. Ah, we didn't even talk about the necromancer section. Um, Relia says, "Oh my God, Oswin, it's gone." Poor swamp people. Kel says, "The relic, relic of armor, piercing, dispel magic, popping a half of Windstrom back." And in- are we just making stuff up at this? That was point? that was last chapter too. The halfling, remember? Okay. Oh, the halfling. Um, and then Lonray saying Remy could r- report directly from Hellas. That lets lets everybody knows of its existence. Um, and then Waime says, as Karash, uh, struggling with being a necromancer or peril and his oh. whole like Jekyll Hyde thing going on. I completely, right. I completely forgot about as yeah. like losing I... Ishvani. <laughs> I know there's the whole, there's the whole necromancers with all of those, the Noel necromancer, the mother of graves fighting off Caligma. I mean, there's that whole section we didn't even talk about. So yeah. we're going to have to end it here. We are at almost two hours. So if 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 you guys want to continue the, the discussion in another kind of official capacity like this, ping wiggles. We have Wednesday. The next chapter doesn't come out for a week. So we couldn't pick this back up with more specific scenes on Wednesday if anybody would like to host. That yeah. said, let's let's wrap up. Wiggles, Edra actually Edron, why don't you close us out today? Um I don't really have any closing thoughts right now. And I hope everybody enjoyed the after chapter discussion. I think we broke a record today again with atten- with uh, attendees. Awesome. And yeah, hope you are joining us for the next time. <laughs>